Amen. Well, thank you for coming today. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that you get to hear what we're talking about. We're in this portion of this series we're in called Ambassadors, How to Be Ambassadors for God. The more I talk about these things, the more that I meet people who actually are ambassadors or they're hosts of a group of people or like a concierge at a hotel or somebody who answers on behalf of other people. That's all we are. We're ambassadors for God. And so this morning, we're looking at this idea of how to be ambassadors in the world and how to represent God to other people. The scripture that we've been in is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God is making his appeal through us. God is inviting, he's in this world because we speak about him. We share our lives about him. We pray for other people around us. Again, I want to thank you for filling out these bookmarks with names of people. There are over 50 bookmarks on this table and each one has over five names on it. And so do the math. There are a lot of people being prayed for and a lot of people who we want to invite back to God, invite closer to God. And I believe that God has a word for people. God wants to constantly pull people into his kingdom and into a relationship with him. I want to, before I get into Luke 24, I want to remind you again of where we're at and why we are ambassadors. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul He says to young Timothy, this pastor, he says, For this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God. God gave you a gift, and I want you to fan that into flame. How many of you have ever lit a campfire before? And you didn't have all these special tools and all the special blowtorch. My brother has a blowtorch and he just puts a bunch of logs together and he just blows this blowtorch till the log totally starts being consumed. I'm like, that's kind of cheating. But anyway, uh, fan into flame. Basically, you know how you make uh, kindling and you put newspaper and you have to kind of make sure that there's no breeze blowing it out and you have to fan it into flame. Paul says, Timothy, you have a gift from God, which is through the laying on of my hands. In other words, if the Holy Spirit gave this gift to Timothy. But listen to this, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. Do you know how many Christians I know that are afraid to be ambassadors for God? They let fear come up in their lives and they stop sharing about Jesus because they're afraid that somebody's going to say something to them that'll hurt or they'll say the wrong thing or they're, they're just maybe not empowered to talk and they sort of let fear capture them. So then Paul moves on. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And this is why we do the whole thing anyway. Verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, not even for things that we can do. God has saved us because of his own purpose and his own grace. Did did you know God has a purpose in this world? Did you know God has a job? God isn't just grandfather God, Santa Claus God, sitting on a throne, big long beard like the Duck Dynasty guys. He's not just sitting there waiting around for all of us to just work for him. He is working. He is constantly calling people into his kingdom with himself, and it's his purpose and his grace that we do this. Speaking of Duck Dynasty, I got to go see Willie Robertson yesterday. We went to this prayer breakfast, this Northern Colorado prayer breakfast, and we went to see the Duck Dynasty CEO guy, Willie Robertson. What a hilarious dude. I mean, for 40 minutes, he just stood up there and talked and told funny stories and got us all totally engaged and and just was funny, super funny guy. He told us he used to sell, sell candy in elementary school. And pretty soon the concession stand at the school was losing money and he was making money. So the principal had to tell him, you need to stop selling candy. And then he started, uh, what else did he do? He said he invented being um, a human jukebox. And so if you gave him a quarter on the bus, he would sing a song for you. And then he tells this great story about his own dad at the end of this little talk. And he said, his dad, Phil, do you all watch Duck Dynasty? Do you know Phil is his dad? And Phil had a terrible life growing up. And he said he got in trouble with the law after he was married and had a few of these boys. He got in trouble. 
And so he ran off into the woods for four months to live by himself and run away from the law. And he said after four months, they found him near a log. He had a 105 degree temperature. He could have died. But one preacher had come along and from another state got a phone call that he should come up and meet this guy in a bar. And he, he got to meet Phil and he told him about Jesus. Phil rejected Jesus. He's like, I don't want anything to do with it. And then this whole thing happened and he ended up in this in the forest. He ended up trying to survive and he came to his senses, he said. And he went back to that pastor. They went back and they got their life straightened out. And now they have an influence and an impact on millions of people in faith. And so then Willie stopped his talk and he goes, I want to ask you a question. Which one are you in the story? Are you the preacher who would have come across the state to come and talk to my dad? Do you share your faith like that? Are you maybe my mom who was in an abusive, hard marriage relationship for all these years? Maybe you know what it's like to be one of the kids who was abused growing up with a dad like that. He said, or maybe you're Phil. Maybe you're the guy that's out in the forest running away from God. He said, no matter where you are, God wants to draw near to you. Oh, man. And then he ended with this. He says, the guy I love in the Bible the most is the Apostle Peter. He says, I relate to that guy. He says, I love that Peter's in the Bible because that gives me an excuse to want to be close to God. Peter was a screw up. Peter did all these crazy things as a disciple of God, but he gave his life and his heart to Jesus. You know, the guy that isn't named in the Bible, but he's known in the Bible is the rich young ruler. He says that guy, he had an encounter with Jesus. He stood next to Jesus of all things. He stood with the master, the Messiah. And Jesus said, go sell all your stuff. And the guy said, no, I'd rather have my stuff. And he walked away from Jesus. He says, you know what that guy's name is? We don't know his name. He's known for being addicted to his money. He doesn't have a name in the Bible. He says, just like us, are we known for our addiction? Are we known for what catches us up in sin? Are we known for the things that trip us up? Or are we the kind of person that would give our heart to Jesus and be known by our name? Oh, I loved it. It was an incredible talk. And it reminded me of where we're going today to be ambassadors for God is to to give our life to Jesus, but then to also talk about Jesus and share. You know this thing that I gave you in your program last week, this BLESS curriculum? This is really effective. This is a way for us to look at five different ways that we can share our faith with people. And last week I talked about, number one, it begins with prayer. It begins with writing names of people down and praying over people that we long for them to know God. If you want to grab one of these programs or if you want to fill out a bookmark, we can pray as a church over your friends. Is there somebody that you love that you want to draw back to God? We would love for you to fill out a bookmark and for us to pray as a group over them. The thing I want to talk about today is how to listen with care and how to eat together. I think how to eat together is pretty obvious. But I want to talk about how do we listen with care. And then next week I want to talk about how do we serve with love, and how do we share our story? So if you have your program and you want to fill out some notes, consider this. How do we listen with care in other people's lives? And now I'm a pastor. I get paid to listen to people. So, you know, I'm a professional listener, if you will. That was supposed to be a joke. But uh, I do. I listen to people, and I have an ear for people. And when I talk with people, I tend to listen behind the words that they're saying. How do you listen to people? Do you listen to their story and just kind of wait for them to stop talking and take a breath so that you can cut in and start talking with them? Or do you listen to them? Do you engage with them? And we're going to talk about ways that we can listen with care. Number one is walk with people through their suffering. Do you know this is the most effective way to listen to somebody's heart? Is to walk with them through what they're suffering. A lot of people wear a mask. A lot of people are suffering. All of us have faced something that's difficult or sad or hurtful and hard to get through. It's the most effective way to actually listen to what a person has to say. Because you kind of move past the five o'clock news and you move past politics and you move past the sports and you move past all these sort of 
surface things that we talk about a lot, and you get into listening to their lives. Now, some people weren't raised with a listening kind of atmosphere and attitude, and so it's kind of hard to share. So I want to share with you how this works. If we look at Luke chapter 24, I'm going to talk with you about how Jesus listened to these people when they were depressed. So here's how the story goes. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 13, it says, Now, that same day, do you know what day this was? This was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. This is the day that people are in Jerusalem and they're there for the Passover feast. And Jesus was crucified on Friday and he was dead all day Saturday. And then on Sunday, he rose from the dead. So this is the day that the resurrection happened. This is the new dawn. This is the first day of creation, if you will, after Jesus came back to life. That same day, two of them, two of who? The disciples. They were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles or 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. By the way, do you know the speed of walking? We walk generally at a pace of 3.1 miles an hour. If you were to go for a walk and walk for an hour, you would generally cover three miles. So how long would these guys have been walking from one town to another for seven miles, over two hours, maybe two and a half hours. So they're walking along and they're talking about the things that happened about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened that weekend. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Do you know what that tells me? I wonder how often Jesus shows up for us today. I mean, if he showed up for these guys, does Jesus just show up and start walking with us? I mean, I don't know what your theology is. I don't know how you were raised in the church. I don't know what you believe about the book. But if Jesus resurrected from the dead and he's God and God can be ever present, Jesus could show up anywhere at any time. I mean, it says in Scripture, he's at the right hand of the Father, and he's with the Father, but could he not just come and sometimes show up? And he's walking, and they don't recognize him. And he asks them, hey, guys, what are you talking about? I love that. Have you ever just shown up at work and asked some guy, hey, what are you guys talking about? Hey, hey, girls, what are you, what are you talking about? What's going on? This is amazing because the very next verse caught me off guard. They stood still. They stopped walking. Their faces were downcast. They were depressed. They're like, oh, Jesus died. And it changed our lives. We thought he was the one. And he he died. What are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. And he died. They stood still. They just were overcome with emotion. And then one of them named Cleopas. By the way, his name is written in the book. He's not the rich young ruler without a name. He's the guy that talked to Jesus. And he said, excuse me, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know these things that have happened here in these last few days? Like, you can imagine his thought of like, what are we talking about? Are you kidding? Did you miss this whole thing that happened, Jesus was crucified, and you're asking me what we're, are you the only guy that missed the whole thing? Were you not watching TV? Were you not on your phone? Were you, did you miss the whole deal? And Jesus goes, what things? I love that. I love that Jesus wants our perspective. Do you know Jesus listens to you, and he cares, and he wants you to share from your heart the things that are on your mind? Jesus says, what, I don't, what things? totally playing dumb, totally listening to what they would say about him. So they go on. Well, you know, about this Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, and he was powerful in word and deed, and before God and all the people. In verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one. We hoped he was 
the Messiah that was going to redeem Israel. What that means is they thought he was going to be like King David, the ruling king who would come in and march in and take over the city militarily and overthrow the, the Romans and overthrow this crucible that they were under. But he didn't. He did something else. And what's more, they said, it's the third day now since this took place. He kept telling us on the third day something would happen. On the third day, he would come back. On the third day, well, now it's the third day, and they're crushed. In verse 22, in addition to some of that, some of our women amazed us. They went even to the tomb this morning, but they didn't find his body. You can just hear how disappointed these guys are. And then they came and told us about it, and that they had seen this vision of these angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the woman said, but they didn't see Jesus. Okay, just pause the tape for a minute. Just, Jesus is listening to all of this. And I'm sure he's smiling like, are you kidding me? Wait until I drop this news. Wait until I tell you the answer of what's going on. And these guys are just like, oh, totally down. And then Jesus says to them, listen to the sarcasm in Jesus' voice. He goes, how foolish are you guys? Now, I think the reason he says that is because Cleopas said to him, how foolish are you? Are you kidding me? You're not even here, and you, like you didn't even know what's going on. So Jesus retorts a little bit and goes, hey, how foolish are you guys? And he kind of delivers back to them. Are you so slow to believe what the prophets had spoken? Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wow. That is a lot of conversation. There's a lot in there. And no wonder they had two and a half hours of walking so Jesus could fill them in. Okay, <clears throat> starting in page one, and he's like, Let's talk about all these prophecies of the Messiah. And then, I don't have this on the screen, but Jesus walks with them the rest of the way. And then Jesus acts like he's just going to walk on by, like, okay, guys, nice talking to you. I'll see you later. And he keeps going. I love that. Do you know why I love that? It's because God invites us to follow him. He doesn't badger us and grab us by the shirt collar and say, you have to do these things. He says, hey, I'm just going to keep going. So, I mean. If you want to follow me, I'm going to... Jesus does this a number of times in the New Testament. Do you remember when, when the disciples were scared and their boat is on the water and Jesus goes walking by on the water? It says he was going to walk past them. And they called out to him, hey, Jesus. And he came back and saved them. Do you remember that one? There are times where Jesus just wants to walk by, but he wants us to seek up after him, to call after him and not just sort of be too busy for him. And anyway, at the end of this passage, they invite him to come in for a meal. They invite him to sit down. And then when he presents the bread to them, I'm sure that his hands expose these nail scars and they, the light went on. They discovered it was really him the whole time. Let me talk a little bit about how do we listen well? Look at Jesus. Look at what he did. How do we listen well? Number one was walk with people in their struggle. Number two is ask some faith questions to people. It's okay to ask a faith question. You don't have to ask doctrine questions. You can just ask them if they have faith. I had this great opportunity yesterday at this breakfast. I was sitting with a friend, and he had brought another friend. And I didn't know this other person, so I introduced myself, and he was talking about his job and how hard it was. He was like a warden in a prison, how hard it was to kind of work with these guys in jail. And the first thing in my mind was like, do you have any kind of faith? So I just said, are you a faith kind of person? And he goes, um, no, not really. I was like, oh, I was kind of caught off guard. I mean, I didn't mean to, gosh, I hope I didn't step on your toes. What? He goes, well, me and my wife were part of a church. We were part of faith, but not really anymore. It doesn't work for me. I was like, whoa, that's, he was honest. So then the next whole hour, I was praying for the guy, just praying that God's spirit would open up his heart and he would just become receptive to God and what this person was saying. And oh. so it's okay to ask faith questions like Jesus did. Hey, what are you guys talking about? 
what things, what's been going on. In fact, this handout that I have in your program for you, today we have these other two handouts. See if you can find those. One of them is on listening with care, this green one. And on the back side of this listening with care, it gives you some questions that you can ask other people in faith. Super simple things, non-offensive things, super easy. Listen, do you have any religious background or what, is, what does it mean to you? What does God mean? What is the story of your faith journey? Um, have you ever had what you would consider a spiritual experience? And what happened? Tell me about that. Or I often talk with people who are interested in spiritual things, but not really interested in organized religion. Do you have any experience with that? Do you have any background with that? Do you think there really is a God? What do you think God thinks of all of this? What questions would you like to ask God if you really could? I mean, these are incredible questions to ask people. They're not offensive. They're super easy. And it's just a great way to get involved in a conversation. So number three is to remain in a person's life. When they go through trouble, when they go through heartache, when they feel broken, when life is hard, just stay with them. You don't have to tell them all the right answers. You don't have to be right about all your doctrine. You don't have to prove anything in the Bible. You don't have to tell them, you know, they're wrong about their lifestyle. Just remain in their lives. Stay with a person who's struggling. It's a great way to listen to somebody's life. And the longer you stay with them, the more trust you build in their life. And they might begin to ask you questions. Hey, why do you have such consistent character when I'm going through hard things? I don't know really how to trust God. Could you show me that? You never know what kind of interaction you might have. My son's a sophomore at UNC. He tells me that he just has this faith in God. We were talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he's just such a calm kid. He's just such an easygoing dude. He just doesn't get rustled up about anything. And he says his roommates in his house are all worried about what job to get, and I'm going to graduate soon, and I hope I get my teacher job, and I hope all, ah, and they get all frantic. And the kid's like, it'll work out, man. You just got to trust God. God's going to walk you through it. He just has this gift of listening and of faith and I just think that's what we need. We need to just remain in people's lives. I love John Maxwell. He writes this, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I absolutely love that. I think that as as people of faith, as ambassadors for God, we need to just care about people's lives. Push aside all the right and wrong. Push aside all the politics. Push aside who's better, who's worse, who makes more money, who doesn't, who has a better job, a better marriage. Just be in people's lives and care for them and listen. And here's number four, if you're still filling something out, eat together. I almost put the word duh after this, but we just need to spend time and eat together with people. And like I said, at the end of Luke 24, Jesus keeps walking and they invite him in to come and have a meal with him and Eating together is what draws people together in conversation. In fact, if you know some people who don't know God and they don't have a faith walk with God and you just simply invite them to have a meal, I bet conversation would open up. The more you invite people to come in, look at a few of these verses in scripture and Jesus was invited to Matthew's house in Mark chapter two. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Levi was the tax collector, Matthew, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, and they were, for there were many who followed him. Why were there so many tax collectors and sinners in the house? Because they were friends of Levi. He had just a party at his house, and all these common people came and ate with Jesus. How about at Zacchaeus' house in Luke 19, when Jesus reached the spot, you remember the tree where Zacchaeus was climbed up and he was trying to look for Jesus? He looked up at Zacchaeus, he said, hey, come down here. I got to go to your house today. Kind of self-invited himself over. I love that. Here's another one. Maybe the woman at the well. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus was already there. And he said, hey, will you give me something to drink? It says his disciples had gone out of town to buy some food. Jesus was available just to eat and drink with people. Here's another one. 
at the Pharisee's house. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to come and have dinner with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. You know what that tells me? Is even the people that opposed Jesus, they invited him in. They wanted to hear his side of the story. Do you invite people in that disagree with you politically? Do you invite people in to your house if they disagree with you theologically? They have another view of something that you stand firm on in your doctrine. Would you invite somebody in who you totally disagree with? Like the Pharisees invited Jesus in. They're like, who is this guy? I don't know. Let's have a meal together. Let's find out. Here's another great verse in Luke chapter 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, Oh, this guy was one of the higher up, one of the CEO class. Jesus went with him, and people watched him. And here's a great one to end on. In John chapter 21, Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And he had gone out, and he walked on the beach, and he started a breakfast. And he yells out at the fishermen, Peter and Andrew and James and John. They went back to work after the resurrection. They're, I'm going fishing. And Jesus calls out, hey, I was fishing last night. And they're like, oh, we didn't catch anything. He goes, throw your nets on the other side again. Do you remember when he did that, when they started their ministry? And Jesus goes, hey, throw your nets on the other side. And they did. And they caught so many fish, they could hardly bring it in. And then Jesus says, hey, bring some of those fish in that you just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat and he dragged in the net ashore. Then verse 12, Jesus said to them, come on, let's have breakfast. Let's just eat together. Let's just be together. None of the disciples dared ask him who he was because they knew that he was the Lord. And then Jesus, he broke bread with them and he did the same with the fish. And this is the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples. You know what you can do as an ambassador for God is just invite people in to your life. Have a barbecue at your house. Invite people in and enjoy fellowship, enjoy food together. That's what ambassadors do. I want to coach you a little bit on where we're going to go as a church. I get to take a break in March and do a little sabbatical time. And my wife and I have booked a couple trips already, some ways we're going to go kind of get refreshed. But the Lord is already speaking to me about a vision for our church, a way to go, a place that we can head. And I'm going to preach on all this next Sunday and what we can do as a church. And I love our little vision back here, reach each one. And I think we're called to reach new people, but that's kind of hard to decipher. It's kind of hard to tell what we're supposed to do. And so recently I found uh, God's been speaking to me in scripture. And I think I want to clarify what this means by basically helping people find and follow Jesus. That's what I want to do. I want our church to help people find Jesus and follow Jesus. And do you know how we do that? Three simple steps, and I'll preach on this next week. One of them is find somebody you love. Two, just tell them what you know. And three, bring them with you. Find, tell, bring. So easy. Just find somebody you love. People we already care about in our life. Tell them what you know about God. And then bring them with you to church. Bring them with you into your community. Bring them with you into a small group or go serve somewhere or be part of something. And God just wants us to invite people in. That's what we are called to do. Let me remind you again that we're in this blessed curriculum because I think God is calling us to bless other people, to be ambassadors in the world that will bless other people with the kind of faith that we have and the faith that we know. And remember, in 2 Timothy, Paul says, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He didn't call us to be afraid of this job. We shouldn't be afraid of sharing what we know. He gave us a spirit of power and of love and self-control or self-discipline, the ability to walk in confidence with God. So don't be ashamed of our testimony. God is calling us to live and to act and to walk and represent him in the world. Again, I'm going to pray over these names and I'm going to Invite God's spirit to just do some work in our lives. So let's pray together. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, but my life isn't all that together. I I don't know how to share God with people when my life is a wreck. My thought is, uh, you might be saying, well, pastor, you get paid to be good. I'm just good for nothing. I don't get paid to be good. I don't get paid to do good things. I don't get paid to share Jesus. I don't care about money. The point is, God has called all of us on a mission to share his love in the world. And let me remind you, God doesn't want all of your stuff together before you can share. He gets your life together when 
you share as you fall in love with Jesus. And here's why. Here's this verse I want you to go home with. In John chapter 15, Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about how we remain in Jesus, and we are part of his vine, and he gives us the power, and by his spirit, he produces fruit in our life. I want you to hear this verse, though. Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, and fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you, this is my command, love each other. He's like, you didn't choose me. I'm the one who chose you. I'm the one who gave you this commission, this call to be an ambassador in the world. And all it takes is love. All it takes is inviting somebody in. All it takes is listening, sharing our life and love with Jesus. Amen. We receive the blessing this morning as you go. We open our hands like this to receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen. 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 Amen.